So some microorganisms are unique in the sense that they actually prefer to live in a high salt concentration. Most microorganisms, if you put them in an environment where there was a high salt concentration, that creates a hypertonic environment for them that pulls the moisture out of their cells and they shrivel and die. The exception to the, that role, though, are halophiles. Halophilic bacteria are bacteria that prefer to grow and live in a high salt concentration. This is common among bacteria in the Staphylococcus genus, such as Staphylococcus aureus. These bacteria do have special pumps built into their cell membrane that allows them to control how much um, moisture they lose from their cells, so they ideally do prefer a high salt concentration. This is the reason why most skin infections are caused by Staphylococcus. Our skin has a high salt concentration as a result of sweat, so any type of bacteria that would be able to survive and thrive on the skin must be a type of bacterium that is halophilic and prone to growing in high salt concentration. So for that reason, um, Staphylococcus is the leading bacterium um, in skin infections. Microorganisms will also um, form various relationships with other hosts, um, which they can be dependent on for survival. Some of these relationships are good, some are bad. Um, there's three different types of relationships that can exist, um, mutualistic relationships, commensalistic relationships, and then a parasitic relationship. So in a mutualistic relationship, both parties benefit, meaning the microorganism um, benefits and the host that it is living within also benefits. So um, the best example of this is E. coli strain K12 that lives in our large intestine. This particular strain of bacteria produces vitamin K for us, which actually helps with blood clotting. So it's very beneficial for us to have. But E. coli also benefits because it gets to live in an environment that is rich with nutrients. So both parties, E. coli and us as the human host, benefit. For that reason, it's a mutualistic relationship. Commensalistic relationships are those where one member benefits while the other is neither harm nor benefit, it's just kind of neutral. An example of this would be Staphylococcus epidermidis that lives on our skin. It benefits because it gets a nutrient-rich environment, it feeds off of our skin oils, um, and then it also has a high salt concentration environment, which it likes um, because of the sweat. So it's getting something out of the relationship. Us, as the human host, we're just neutral, they don't harm us, but they don't really, staph epidermidis doesn't really benefit us either. So it is a commensalistic relationship where the staph benefits and us as the host is neither harmed nor benefited. Most pathogens um, or microorganisms that cause disease exist in a parasitic relationship with the host, which means that the microorganism benefits at the expense of the host, so the host is harmed. This is standard for any type of um, virus-host cell relationship. The virus infects the host cell. It benefits because it hijacks the host cell and uses the host cell as kind of a um, place to replicate more viruses, so it benefits. But what happens to the host cell? I mean, ultimately, the host cell dies, so it is at the expense of the host cell. Um, the host is harmed. So it is a parasitic relationship. So assuming that the bacteria have the right environment um, to grow, they will go through something called binary fission cycles. So if bacteria have uh, access to nutrients, moisture, a stable temperature, a good pH, they will grow and divide. Um, and the process by them going through division cycles and producing more of themselves is known as binary fission. Binary fission is very similar to what we would talk about in um, human cells such as mitosis, where basically the bacterial cell would duplicate itself and turn into two bacterial cells. So during a binary fission cycle, one bacterial cell will always become two, 
and then those two will divide and form four, and then those four will divide and form eight, etc. So here we have a parent bacterial cell that wants to go through binary fission. It's going to make a copy of its DNA, so we have two copies of DNA. Then the cytoplasm and envelope start to pinch inward until eventually the cell generates two new daughter cells. So the process by which a bacterial cell duplicate its, duplicates itself is known as binary fission. A generation time is how long it takes for a bacterial population to double. So essentially it's how long it takes for a bacterial cell to go through a binary fission cycle. How long it's going to take that one cell to divide and make two. And then how long it takes those two cells to divide and make four. Um, most bacterial cells, it takes them about 30 to 60 minutes to go through a binary fission cycle, so that would be their generation time. Um, some bacteria are faster, some bacteria are slower. Uh, so for example, E. coli is a little bit faster, it's about every 20 minutes, um, but something like Mycobacterium tuberculosis takes much longer. Um, but as long as that environment is stable and they have access to nutrients, um, and like I said, a stable environment with temperature and pH, they will continuously go through binary fission cycles um, every 20, 30, 40 minutes. So there is a little bit of math here. If we know how many bacterial cells we're starting with and how um, long we're going to let them grow and what their generation time is, we can actually calculate how many bacterial cells will be present after, um, a, after incubation or growth has occurred. So the questions will always be formatted like this, and then you just have to pull out some important information to put into the formula that we have up here. So the questions will be worded as, if a, if a single E. coli bacterium has a generation time of 20 minutes and is allowed to divide for one hour, how many cells will be present after the hour is up? So basically what this is telling us is we're putting one E. coli bacterium into, pl into a plate. We are going to let it grow for an hour, and we know that it takes it 20 minutes to go through binary fission cycles. So knowing this, how many bacterial cells are going to be present after that hour is up? So we always want to pull out our three important pieces of information. Our three important piece of, pieces of information is how many cells are we starting with, um, what is the generation time, and how long are they dividing. So in this one, we're starting with one cell, the generation time is 20 minutes, and we're going to let them to divide for one hour. So once we have that information, we can use our formula. So our formula is to take the total time, which is often in hours, and you'll want to convert it into minutes, but the total time, and divide that by the generation time, which is something that you'll be given. And that gives us our number of generations. So that tells us how many times the cells can divide. It doesn't tell us how many cells are going to exist, but how many times can they divide within that time range. And then we have to continue on with the formula to figure out how many cells actually will exist. So once we have this number, what we're going to take it, what we're going to do is take 2 and raise it to the power of whatever we got up here. This 2 always is always a 2. It never changes because bacterial cells always double. So you take 2 and raise it to the power of whatever we get up here. And then the last step is to take that number and multiply it by the number of original cells, which is a number that you'll be given. And that's going to give you how many cells will exist um, in total. So if we were doing that for this problem here, we would take the total time, which was one hour, 60 minutes. We'll divide it by the generation time, which was 20 minutes. And that's going to give us an answer of three. So we know E. coli, if it takes 20 minutes to go through a binary fission cycle and we're giving it an hour to grow, it will be able to go through three cycles. But again, we want to know how many cells will actually be present after it goes through three cycles. So we take two and we raise it to the power of three, because that's what we got up here. 
Remember the two always stays, but this number is going to change depending on what we get right here. So two to the third power is eight. We're not completely done yet. We need to take the number that we get here, which is eight, and we need to multiply that by the number of original cells. So eight times one, since the number of original cells was just one, um, our final answer would be eight cells. So to look at another problem, so if we have one that looks like this, if a Staphylococcus saprophyticus, if Staphylococcus saprophyticus has a generation time of 30 minutes and is allowed to grow for four hours, how many cells will be, how many cells will be present at the end of that? And we're assuming we're starting with eight cells. So again, we need to take the total time, which our total time for this is four hours. So if we want to convert that into minutes, that will be 240 minutes. Then what we need to do is to divide that by the generation time. So our generation time is 30. 240 divided by 30, that's going to give us eight. So we know that if Staphylococcus saprophyticus takes 30 minutes to go through a um, binary fission cycle, after four hours, it will be able to go through eight cycles. But again, we wanna know how many cells will actually be present after it goes through that eight cycles. So what we need to do at this point is we need to take two and we need to raise that to the power of eight. And that is going to give us 256. So we're not done yet. We need to take 256 and we need to multiply that by the number of original cells, which our number of original cells was eight. And that is going to give us a final answer of 2,000 48 cells. So that is how many Staphylococcus saprophyticus cells would exist after that four hours is up. So if you do need more practice with this in D2L, um, in the microbial nutrition and growth op optional resources, there is a practice generation time word document. So you can click on that and it has several practice problems with the answers worked out so you can go through and get some more practice with um, generation times. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is a standard bacterial growth curve. So with bacteria in the environment, um, they have unlimited access to nutrients so they will essentially grow and grow for extended periods of time, but in a petri dish, there's only so much nutrients. So in a Petri dish, they go through different phases. And we look at that growth over a period of time as the standard bacterial growth curve. So this is looking at the number of bacterial cells over a period of time. There's four different phases, lag, what we're calling as a log phase, but sometimes you will see it as exponential, but in this course, log phase. Um, stationary and death phase but we can kind of see over a period of time the bacterial cells grow rapidly then they kind of level off and then they start to die rapidly um, when they're within a petri dish so we are going to take a look at these four different phases and what happens during each of them